Hello and welcome to our latest podcast in our Thought Leadership series. I'm Jennifer Jones, Director of Consultancy Services at Collingwood, and today I have with me Mark Whitworth to discuss the topic of leading accelerated growth. Mark is the Chief Executive of Peel Ports Group, the UK's second largest ports operator. Headquartered in Liverpool, they also have major facilities in Clydeport, London Medway, Haysham and Great Yarmouth. Previously to Peel Ports, Mark headed up Peel Airports and was also a director at Speedy Hire PLC. He has a reputation for fixing the performance of businesses and driving substantial growth. And most recently, he's overseen the investment of the £350 million project to build Liverpool 2, a new deep water container terminal at Peel Ports headquarters in Liverpool. Liverpool 2 is capable of birthing the world's biggest container ships and has doubled the amount of containers the port can handle. It's an integral part in the Northern Powerhouse vision, connecting the disparate cities' economies across the North. And Mark's reputation for stimulating growth is, is no coincidence. Despite investing more than £650 million in Liverpool alone in the past year, the same level of investment is planned for the next five years. And since Mark joined in 2010, he's overseen company profit growth from £119 million to in excess of £210 million per year. Firstly, th thank you for talking to me today about leading accelerated growth. You've obviously carved out a reputation for growth leadership for yourself in the market. What's what's your secret? Yeah, well, there's no no magic wand, but I think uh, as always, uh, it's having a good plan is at the core of what we what we do and I guess how I work. So I think setting out a clear plan um, or a roadmap uh, that that sort of spans a relevant term for the business. So in our case, over five years. Reviewing it frequently, ensuring it's fit for purpose, and ensuring it's delivered. You know, while of course remaining agile to to review it regularly, um, and yeah, deliver it with uh, with precision. So we'll have listeners here who have different growth aspirations, and they may be looking to you know grow from local to global, or private to public, or challenger to leader, from millions to billions even. What would your message be? You know, would your message be the same in all of these scenarios? I think. The, the core message would remain the same, yeah. So I think, you know, I find it interesting at times how how often people, businesses, just continue to do the same thing year in, year out. So even when it may be, be, be delivering success, actually they don't challenge what they're doing. So for me, I think it's really important that, that you understand your market and you understand your customers and where your, fit, your, where your business fits in, in, in terms of uh, both of those aspects. So I think it's really important that, that when you are setting out your business plan, you understand what the market is, what's addressable, excuse me, um, how you intend to position your business to achieve market growth, yeah, <coughs> excuse me, and, and ensure that your message and your position is really understood. And I think those attributes are relevant whether you are a corner shop or whether you are an, an international conglomerate. Yeah. yeah, so it's alignment, really, of all of that. Together, alignment, isn't it? yeah, of course. Um, so how do you establish or, or go about establishing what the key areas of growth are then? Well, in our case, I think, um, and this, I, I, again, I think this is quite generic, but, but in our case, we've got a plethora of customers, and I think um, probably no different to most businesses you come across. 80% of our growth will probably come from our existing customers. So it's about backing the right horses, really, yeah. Uh, so it's picking the customers that have you know, growth capability or growth aspirations, understand what they need or how we can facilitate and, and support that growth and align ourselves with them accordingly. Uh, and that's crucial. It's certainly been crucial to our success. So, for example, in the Northwest, uh, Jag Land Rover has been one of the UK's most successful companies in recent years. We have worked tirelessly at building a relationship with, with uh, Jag Land Rover and helping support their growth the whole logistics supply chain. So, in in your opinion, what are the key drivers then for accelerated growth? Which is and which is the, the most important? Well, well for us again, um, if I think about this is very port specific, but I think again, if you just take the principle, you can apply it to any market. One of the key uh, areas for ports in the UK has been government energy policy. So, for example, the switch from coal actually killed one industry, the coal import industry, and actually created a new one with things like biomass and offshore wind. Uh, so again, some of those external factors you really have to have a cognizance of and you know, appreciate how your business is going to fit in to capitalise on any opportunities that may arise. So there's a good example, change in energy policy. Another good example, uh, again, for our business specific, 
would be HS2. On the face of it, you know, um, product coming into the UK by the south and then moving north by, by the rail is probably not good news for our business. But actually, as HS2 is delivered, it creates all kinds of opportunities for us. The construction itself, all the, all the, the products, aggregates and so on that will sort of flow from it. Um, so for me, it really is being quite agile uh, as a business, understanding your market, understanding your proposition and how you're going to support uh, and, and, I guess, capitalise on opportunities that come your way. It's too easy to continue doing what you've always done and remain on the hamster wheel. And I think that's probably where, where we're quite different. I'd like to think where I'm quite different as a leader. Yeah, so, and you know, knowing you that... Um that external viewpoint it comes across very strongly, you know, yeah. and, and you obviously you know, have a have a huge interest in that. But like you said, it's about aligning that external viewpoint, isn't it, with what you're really good at in the market and the customers that you have. Oh, that's that's great. Um, so, Peel Ports in themselves, I mean, you, you've you've mentioned there, but they're known as masters in development and, and investment. Uh, you know, six hundred and fifty million in the last in the last year, for example. Um, how far into the horizon do you look, and, and how do you evaluate the right strategy? For you and Peel. Okay. So well, typically we have a five-year plan which mm-hmm. rolls. So you know, what, what do I mean by that? Five-year plan which we review every year and make mm-hmm. sure it's still fit for purpose, and that whole plan and outlook is, is, is very agile. Many of our developments have a time horizon of, uh, of 10, 20, 30 years. So I think the answer to your question is is, is long term. I think one of the, one of the 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 attributes of our of our shareholders and as our of our business is that we do have this very long term outlook. So where, where we will invest initially might not be a very obvious choice. So for example, L2, there is more than enough container capacity in the UK today. By us investing in L2, what it's enabled us to do is attract market that already exists and then actually anticipate how that market will change over the course of the next 10-15 years. So as logistics dynamics change. So, you know, it's very, very different to just looking forward 12 months and, you know, how am I going to influence my p l which is how many businesses behave. You know, when we have to deliver our plan to our shareholders, we have to convince them that actually that plan will be as fit in five years' time as it is today. And actually, that we also fund the development, you know, th- through, the, through the term for, for the business performance. So again, that strategic, externally looking, but really f- at a far horizon yeah. is, is critical, really, for, for you and in terms of driving that, that growth. Yeah. Again, I think, you know, I guess my, my response is, is very ports specific, but by the nature of the beast, ports are long-term infrastructure plays. Our markets are very often driven by long-term decisions. Mm-hmm. I've already refer- referred to the energy policy. So usually you can make you know decisions with a long term outlook yeah. and anticipate what's going to happen, um, and I think it's then being quite agile and actually position ourselves to capitalise on, on what happened, or actually in some instances lead what may happen, as opposed to wait for it to just come your way. And I think that's what separates us from from uh, many of our peers. Yes, being very proactive about yeah, that. Absolutely. Um, so. Against sort of that context, how have your leadership priorities or style and techniques really helped or, or hindered that that growth and that approach? Has, has it developed over the years or you know, have you consciously changed it? I think it's fundamentally changed. I, it's horses for courses. So uh, before I, I, uh, I came into this industry, I was also in a, in a, a service sector, but which was much more in the now, very service-led. The customer was, I guess, had typically had a lead time of, of hours and days, not not months and years. Um, so for that reason, I think my whole style was very much very aggressive, very in the now, very agile. I think um, uh, many have commented that, ha- that 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 have known me a long time that my style has say somewhat adapted. Um, it has to when you're making decisions that actually have investment decisions behind that that, that you know could equate to actually close to a billion pounds now in terms of, our, of what we've spent since. Uh, in my time here and have an outlook of 20, 30 years. So yeah, it's a lot more considered. Um, while I'd like to think still very assertive as opposed to aggressive, um, yeah, yeah, it, it's had to adapt to the environment that we work with. Yeah. yeah, and you mentioned about aggressiveness. And in terms of leading accelerated growth, what would others say about you? Would, you, would they say that you're assertive or aggressive? I think uh, depending on the audience, of course. So at the end of every financial year, when we're paying out the bonuses, most people would say I'm very assertive. <laughs> when we're in the middle of a financial year and I'm driving for a result, many would say I'm aggressive. But I think on balance, 
I'd like to think I have a very positive leadership style. Yeah, and knowing you as I do, I think I'd absolutely agree with that. Yeah. Um, so you, you've overseen huge changes at Peel Ports during your tenure, your huge investment, restructures, acquisitions. Which aspect of those changes have been the most challenging for you and, and how did you overcome them? Okay, I think what I'm about to describe probably is quite common in, in many larger businesses. So when I joined Peel Ports, Peel Ports had sort of three separate trading divisions, each with a managing director and its own separate infrastructure, each quite autonomous and on the face of it very, very successful. Um, I felt that had that success had a, a limited lifespan. Uh, we, we removed that management structure, overlaid it with a group management structure, so the direction came pretty much from the centre and delivery w w was local. That was a monumental shift. Mm. You know, the psychology of that change was immense and it was, it was hard work. And I think, you know, if I look back at some of the difficulties, um, I think one of, the, one of my attributes is that I'm quite intuitive. I typically have my nose sort of, you know, an ear close to the ground so I know, so know what's going on. Um, and I, I can usually take a decision that, that uh, you know, I can live with, even if I don't entirely get it you know, right. I think in the early days here, what I allowed was things like politics to actually slow that decision-making process down. So to be brutally honest, we probably lost you know, a year uh, in, in achieving you know, what we have today, really, for those reasons. So uh, for, for what it's worth, politics and I, don't necessarily go hand in glove, but uh, um, yeah, that's probably my, my biggest regret. But my biggest, one of the biggest uh, achievements, I guess, is driving through that change. And I think the business has seen the benefit of it. Yeah, and learning from it. Yeah, you know, in sure. terms of the next changes that come along. So, w would you say then that you've transformed Peel Ports, or is it an ongoing transformation? Yeah, and by, by the nature of the beast, ports. Um, if uh, I don't sound too, too romantic about it, but ports, if, you know, if, if you default to the sort of the lowest denominator, are actually national assets um, ports are very 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 expensive to actually build so there aren't going to be too many new ones I'm looking forward so yeah but the nature of the beast is the economy changes the sort of landscape manufacturing either leaves the UK or comes back to the UK whatever ports will have an influence over you know um, I guess how those industries are supported so it will ever be evolving you know mm -hmm. so yeah. I keep referring to the energy policy. That's transformed how ports do their business over the last 10 years. And I have absolutely no doubt at all it will transform again. So we'll have to remain agile. And again, it comes back to your initial point, doesn't it, about keeping that external viewpoint. Absolutely. Keeping, yeah. keeping your horizon long, because these things will always happen, and you'll be led by that in terms of transformation rather than it being led internally. For me, I mean, I guess you could define it in different ways, but if I simplify it and say one of the things that we're really good at is having proximity and an intimacy with our customer. Mm -hmm. And that's something that typically ports haven't done in the past. Ports tend to capitalise on, they've got very monopolistic characteristics. For example, if you want to bring your product into Liverpool, then you don't have much choice other than to come in through the port of Liverpool. Yeah, And that tends to generate a behaviour. My outlook is very different. Yes, I may have a, a captive customer mm -hmm. or market for a period of time, but actually, over time, that customer will have a choice. So we need to, you know, work with them and actually develop, uh, I guess, a, a coexistence of, of success. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Great. So while leading through all of those changes, what aspect of it has been the most important to driving that accelerated growth? You know, is it the people? Is it digital product operations, alliances? What What was it for you? All of the above, but but you know, all really resonate from one getting the basics right. And for me, it's about people. Yeah. yeah. So. You know, I think if we look at our business today, we've had huge investment in infrastructure and in technology and so on and so on and so on. But actually, all of those were delivered by having the right people with the right outlook and the right capability. Mm -hmm. um, so people... Starts there. Yeah. And how do you deal then with the people aspect of change? Is it a natural ability or is it a programmed activity? Yeah, it's an interesting one. I think, you know, when I, if I think back the, over the journey, I mean, this is a substantial organisation. Um, and I think, there, you know, I've learned a few lessons uh, over my seven years in the role. As the business grows, the skills that you, you, you have and use in a smaller business are very different from those in a larger business, particularly where there's geography that sort of separates aspects of the business. Um, so I think you need a combination of the two. I, I, I think if we ever got to a day where my, my decision making was purely led by a spreadsheet or by automation or by, you know, without intuition, then I think I'd have lost something, you know. So, so for me, it's a combination of, of you know, 
being at, being quite agile as a business and having structure, yeah, of course, but also being intuitive as well and being under, understand what's going on. Yeah, no, that makes that makes sense. And yeah, and it allows for your natural ability, I think, as well in terms of that intuition, but also sure. with the framework and the structure. Sure. You can't underestimate the, the, the in any organisation the value of having a can-do attitude and a can-do outlook. And we are very fortunate. We have gradually built our capability in, 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 in that area, and uh, it's increasing by the day. So, yeah. Good news. So, irrespective of industry, CEOs are focusing you know, on the challenge of managing exponential change. Our, our, our recent research found that the number one priority for CEOs was innovation and, and change. How do you approach innovation? I mean, you mentioned about energy policy it being quite you know, externally led. But what's what's your approach to it? Again, I'm, I'm going to sort of, there's a theme here to much of what I've said today, and most of it is fairly basic, a lot of it is quite textbook, but I, I strongly believe that actually having um, new talent come into the organisation is very healthy, so one of the things I often get asked about is our churn of people, um, I, I, I don't want to sound like I'm a, I'm a disciple of, of, of um, Jack Welsh, but I think having a, a healthy turnover 10, 15, 20% of, of turnover of staff in a year on balance at the right level is quite healthy. So innovation comes from bringing best practice from other industries. Um, over the last couple of years, we had a, a program where several of our senior management team have gone out um, via different development programs and looked at world-class organisations, tried to understand what best practice looks like from a number of perspectives, whether it be customer service, technology, and so on. So combination of taking you know, people with the capability of understanding what good looks like and, and sending them out to, to, you know, into the market, into the world to look at. And of course, keeping an eye on how our market is uh, uh, and, uh, and the industry is developing. So it's a combination of things really from my part. Mm -hmm. yeah. What about innovation and, and, and accelerated growth then? What correlation do you see there? Is it similar behaviour and attitude to both or are they distinctly different approaches and, and skill sets? Yeah, I, I think that probably the one thing I, I missed uh, just a second ago is the customer. Innovation, of course, has to have a purpose, you know, why are you doing it? Having the latest gadget or the latest, you know, fashion for want of a better term, you know, if it doesn't deliver any value, it doesn't support your customer, why should you be doing it? So I think, again, for us, back to basics, having a proximity to your customer understand what their business needs are and how we support them, certainly in our case, is really, really important. So, for example, we had you know, virtually no, not even worth, worth referring to our market share in the steel sector three years ago. We went to the market, we looked at it, how do we change it, and we realised that technology, really, really, investment in technology could give us a real edge. We invested, we built that capability. Today, we have, you know, without a doubt, we're probably the largest uh, importer and, and, and influence of steel coming into the UK, so... Uh, yeah, yeah, it's a great it's facility. Yeah. And, uh, you know, from what you're saying there as well, it's not necessarily just doing new things and investing in new things, it's also about saying no yeah. to things that, that, that yeah. don't actually affect the end customer and affect for, for sure. I mean, you know, I guess contradiction, um, I, I hope not, but, but, you know, whenever you want to be a service provider, it's, it's people could very simply see that just as, you know, making the customer happy, you know, it has to make the business happy as well. So, for example... You know, you wouldn't expect to buy a £9.99 airline seat and expect, you know, Emirates sort of first class service. So it has to be relevant, yeah, okay? But there are many of our customers that, for them, the most important aspect is actually controlling that value chain, the whole sort of timing of it. And, of course, you know, ensuring that they have the right service and that that surety is the most important factor to them. So, you know, mess, meddling in the sort of pennies and... You know, uh, and, and uh, nickel and dimes really isn't that, that that crucial in the scheme of things. So again, it's, it has to be relative, relevant. Yeah. Have to be relevant. Yeah. yeah that, that, that makes sense. And m moving more on to you, really, I suppose, and your your leadership. I know one of your really key strengths is your ability to keep a really strong grip on a business, but while still maintaining a helicopter view. What would you describe as your key leadership strengths and derailers? Drive. Absolute drive. This, that, that, I guess it's certainly one of my uh, one of my great strengths. Um, I think you know, and a determination to see the business succeed is one of, one of the things that I, I often you know, find myself uh, almost lecturing on occasion about is, is that people people suggesting that uh, people are the most important thing in our business. It's difficult to disagree with that, but ultimately, if 
you always put the business first, make the right business decisions, then you protect the business. Sorry, you protect the people within the business. You allow them security, you allow them to grow and flourish and so on and so on. So I think drive is one of my one of my most significant attributes, I would suggest. And what about derailers? What, what do you yeah. tend to work with? Politics. Um, if I didn't make that clear earlier, I uh, you know, if, if I think about my time here, this business, like many ports, its sort of constitution was was back in was back in the uh, I guess local authorities. Most ports, you know, over the years, at some stage, has been owned by the local authority, and and therefore decisions in in when they were owned by local authorities were weren't always in the in the in in, in the best interest of the business. Yeah, and those kind of uh, those cultures live on, live on a long time, and, and I think it'd be fair to say that within our industry, politics still has a, a significant influence. I find that extremely difficult to deal with. Um, I'm not regarded as uh, as a politician within our business. I think the day when the day comes when I, I do retire or move on or do something, I don't think I'll be in charge of international diplomacy anywhere either. So <laughs> politics for me is my derailer. And you've been at Peel Ports for seven years. What are you most proud of during that time? And what would you, lo- you know, love to go back and change? Okay, well, I guess, what, what would I change? When I joined the business, I genuinely joined um, on the basis of, of almost a favour to, to one of the shareholders here. Um, the plan was to remain with the business for three months on an interim basis, and we'll sort of see how it went kind of thing for both of us. The truth be told, I was, I was planning to go off and do something very different. Um, I think you can never you can never make that first impression again, you know, if I'm truthful. And I think during that first three months, I I I think we 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 we, uh, we held the business together very well. We started laying a foundation for the future, but actually probably didn't have the traction or make the traction that I really would like to have done. So I don't have many regrets. I'm not somebody that sort of li- lives certain my life looking backwards. But if I could change anything, that would be it. That would be it. Yeah. yeah. And what are you most proud of? Well, I guess there's a whole number of things, but but actually, um, consistently delivering the financial performance for the business. So when I joined 2010, the business, like many in the UK, had gone through a torrid time. Um, yeah, the business had pretty much held its own through the recession, but it, 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 it for all intents and purposes, had gone backwards. Um, at that time, our EBITDA, as you referred to earlier, was was a little over 100 million, and, and the challenge was to uh, to double that, uh, and we've done that in excess of that now in, in that period of time. So, I think the fact that we've been able to 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 achieve the shareholder ambitions has meant that the shareholders have continued to invest in the way that they have. Therefore, we've continued to grow, we've created jobs, and everything sort of spiraled from that success. Really. So, if I look back at it, you know, delivering and not faltering once has uh, has been probably one of my. my so that consistency. Absolutely, I mean, yes. Yeah. Boringly consistent. <laughs> Absolutely. So what's next then? Further growth? Further change and transformation? Yeah, look, as I, as I said earlier, ports are what they are. They will inevitably have to, to uh, continue to adapt to serve you know, the UK economy and in some respects the worldwide economy. Um, so you know it will continue to. But from, from, from my personal perspective, we again, we've just recently completed our, our latest five-year plan, complete review. Um, that five-year plan We'll see our EBITDA you know, grow to in excess of £350 million a year, which is quite an achievement if you think back five years where we were. Um, so you know, my, my personal aim is to ensure that we are on the right path to achieving that uh, uh, over the next five years. And then, of course, we have spent what, what actually now is closer to £400 million on delivering L2 and ensuring that that first service arrives in accordance with our plan and delivers the value not only to our business, but hopefully to the northern the part of England, really, or the UK. Uh, uh, so, yeah, they're, they're, they're the two obvious things. Yeah. That's great. Thank you, Mark, for your, your time and your, your, your insights. Um, I hope you've all enjoyed listening to our podcast. Please listen again soon for further insights and thought leadership. But from, for now, from Mark and I, goodbye. <laughs>